Okay, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy this morning. We thank you, Father God, for the fellowship we had last night. And Father, we thank you so much for giving us strength to rise this morning. We thank you for all the blessings that you have poured upon us. Father God, we, we are living in this time of pandemic. And Father God, even though we cannot meet physically, we can meet spiritually and we can meet online. And Father God, I believe that you have called us and, and made it so that we would be alive during this time, Father God, to proclaim your word. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask that you would continue to bless us. And as we study your word, Father God, let us draw nearer and closer to you. Father, we ask that you would give us strength that we may be able to hold on to our faith in the end time, that we may be steadfast in you, Father God, and obedient. Father, we thank you so much, Father God, for our Shiloh International Missions. We ask that you continue to bless each and every member, beginning with our pastor all the way down to our team members, our children, our families. And Father God, we ask that you would bless our senior pastor, Reverend Philip Lee. Father God, bless him, continue to watch over him that, me, that he may continue to proclaim redemptive history throughout the world. We thank you so much for this time and we give you all the praise, the honor and the glory. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. So the title for our topic today in the Bible study is The Saints Who Remain Steadfast in Faith in the End Time. And this, I, you know, the other day I was trying to, you know, I was praying about a topic. So and this is what I believe Father has given me to preach today or talk about today. So the saints who remain steadfast in faith in the end time. So this, I want to talk just a few, um, not too long, but we want to talk, touch on a few uh, points and then we'll end. Okay. So our scripture reading comes from one place, uh, Matthew 24 and 3. Let's read that together. And it says, At, and as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things happen and what would be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. This is the word of God. Amen. So when we look around at the entire world today, uh, it's shrouded in a cloud of darkness. And this should remind us what Jesus said as he was uh, looking down at Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And his uh, disciples asked him about the signs of the end time. And what was Jesus' response to his disciples' questions? What, what did Jesus say to them after they asked him this question? If we look in Matthew 20, uh, 24, verse 4, it says, And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. See to it that no one misleads you. And so as saints in the end time, our Father is warning us today that we must not be misled in the end time. And unfortunately, you, can, you see that, we're seeing that now, a lot of people are being misled. Jesus' uh, response to his disciple is a clear indication that Satan will make the saints fall away through misleading of other human beings in the end time. And the word misled, if we look at this word misled, uh, in Greek, it's planao, and it means to deceive or to lead astray. And this means that the wicked ones will deceive the believers in the end time. And the uh, deception is achieved how? through lies. You know, I'm reminded, you know, our founding our pastor, Reverend Abraham Park, one of the things that he hated most was lies. And this was the one sin that he always warned us about. And why did he warn us about this, this particular sin? Because when our lives are full of lies, then there's no hope. So, in the end times, the wicked ones will lead the believers astray down the path of destruction. 
when we go back and look at uh, Cain's fleshly genealogy, we see lies, deception, and sin that continue down through the lives of different people, even up until now. So if we had to describe the end times, it would be described as a world covered with filthy sins, right? And you can see that today. It's just sins everywhere. And the only way for us to preserve our spirits and keep our bodies blameless and unblemished is to have the fear of God. And why is that? Because the fear of God perfects holiness. And without holiness, we cannot see God. This is what the Bible says. If we look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, I'm using the NIV version. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Amen? So with that as a backdrop, the question today is, what must we do as saints living in the end times? What must we do in order to overcome and remain steadfast in our faith? And so that is the question that we're asking today. And this is what we need to um, discuss just for a short while. So main point number one, we must, in order to remain steadfast, we must distance ourselves from sin. And this is very critical. Um, when we uh, look at the Bible, it dedicates a uh, considerable amount of time recording the deaths of those who died at the end of the 40-year wilderness journey, just before entry into Canaan. And this was due to sin. So after 40 years, they died right before they entered Canaan. And this includes uh, the death of Korah and 250 of his followers who rebelled against Moses. And also we can look at the, uh, the death of the remaining people from the first census. And then again, the uh, 24,000 who died as a result of adultery at Shittim. But perhaps the, the most saddest um, accounts of death are the death of three great leaders of the wilderness journey who died just a short distance away from entering the promised land, Canaan. And we, know, we all know that Canaan foreshadows heaven, right? The kingdom of God. So let's look at those um, three great leaders who died just a short distance um, before entering into Canaan. So first, there's um, Miriam. You know, when we look at Miriam, she was the older sister of Aaron and Moses and the first prophetess we see in the Bible. And she actually played a uh, large role in saving baby Moses. We remember that, right? And when they crossed the Red Sea, she sang the song of victory. We can see this in Exodus chapter 15, verse 20 to 21, if you look there. So clearly, Miriam, she was a faithful leader under Moses during the difficult wilderness journey. However, she died one year prior to their entry into Canaan at Kadesh. And now why is this? Because she spoke against Moses after he married a Cushite woman. But, you know, the Bible says Moses didn't marry her out of fleshly thoughts. You know, Moses act of marrying a Cushite woman was not mot motivated by his emotions, but by the obedience of God's command. And we can see that in uh, Numbers chapter 12, verse 8. So here, um, Miriam, this great wilderness journey leader, died, died one year prior to entry into Canaan. How tragic is that, right? Also, there was um, Aaron. Aaron was the first holy priest and one of the three leaders of the wilderness journey. Uh, he was Miriam's younger brother and Moses' older brother. And Aaron was called at the age of uh, 84 and became the spokesperson for Moses by the command of the Lord. And we can see this in Exodus chapter 7, verse 7, if you look there. However, he too died at the age of 123 in the 40th year of the Exodus which is about eight months prior to entry into Canaan on Mount Hor. Why is that? 
because of the sin of stirring up the Israelites to make the golden calf. We all remember that story very well. The sin of misleading the people and, and invoking evil. The sin of speaking against Moses, just like Miriam did. And the sin of unbelief and disobedience to God's word with regard to the waters at uh, Meribah, at Kadesh. So again, this great leader, Aaron, this, this uh, high priest, a great leader in the wilderness journey, died eight months prior to their entry into Canaan in the 40th year of the Exodus. And then, of course, we have, we have Moses, right? Moses, the great leader of the wilderness journey, received the command to lead the Israelites out of Egypt into the land of Canaan. However, he too concluded his life at the age of 120 years on the 11th month in the 40th year of the Exodus. And his death came after he gave a long farewell sermon on the first day of the same month, which is about two months prior to entry into Canaan. And we can see this in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 3, and also in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 to 7. So, why did Moses die before entry into Canaan? It was at Kadesh that Moses disobeyed God's order to take the staff in his hand and command the rock to give forth water at Meribah. Instead, what did he do? He struck the rock twice, which was the sin of not treating God as holy in the sight of the people. Thus, Moses did not believe in God. Right? We can see this in Numbers 20 and 12. Secondly, he rebelled against God. He broke faith with God. And fourthly, Moses spoke rashly with his lips when he um, struck the rock. This means that Moses, Moses spoke thoughtlessly. And this was due to the people who provoked him for 40 years in the wilderness. And if, we can, uh, if you look at Psalms 106, uh, verses 32 to 33, you'll see that there. So, out of anger, Moses struck the rock twice. However, uh, the Bible states that the anger of a man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So we have to be able to control our anger. If you, if you look at James chapter 1, verse 20, you see that there. We have to be able to control our anger as saints. And it says, the foolish are rash in speech and quick to become angry. Proverbs 14, 29. So as a summary, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses were great leaders in the wilderness. And yeah, they led the Israelites to believe in the promised land. Yet, all three died in the wilderness, unable to enter to, into the land they had greatly desired. And their death with Canaan just a short distance away uh, pro uh, provides a solemn teaching to the believers in the end time. So, you know, we, we all have different roles in the church and we're leaders in the church, but God is saying that we have to be faithful until the very end. And not only do we have to be faithful, we have to be obedient until the very end. So, you know, our Father God, he keeps his faithfulness towards us and he forgives us of our wrongdoing. However, he would not leave the guilty unpunished. This is what the Bible says. I believe that's in Exodus chapter 34, verse 7. We read that it says, He who keeps faithfulness for thousands, who forgives wrongdoing, violation of his law, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Okay? So we have to be obedient. We have to be faithful, especially in these end times. So it is my prayer that as we live our lives during, during these end times and during the pandemic and doing all the evil that is in the world, we must be able to be faithful to our Father and obedient to our Father. So let us remove all sin from our lives and live before our Father with pure hearts that we may go into the kingdom of God and live eternal with our Father. Amen? Amen. Okay, big point number two. In order to remain steadfast in faith in the end times, we must be able to discern the signs of the end time. In the Bible, 
uh, famines are among the signs of the end time. And we can see in Luke chapter 21, verse 11, it says, and there would be massive earthquakes and in various places, plagues and famines. And there would be terrible sights and great signs from heaven. However, uh, one of the signs that we must be aware of is the famine of the word that comes in the end time. And we can see this in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 through 12. And it says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They will roam about to seek the word of the Lord, but they would not find it. So, so the question is, why is the famine of the word so important to understand? It's because this period of famine is part of the tribulation that will come upon the believers in the last days. So what does that mean? This means that believers will be unable to hear the word of God during the times of tribulation because teaching and hearing of the word of God will be prohibited. But just like God forewarned Joseph regarding the years of famine before the years of plenty, God will also give us years of plenty for the word of God before the famine strikes. So right now, we're able to hear the word and, and the word is plenty, right? So it's, our, it's on us to um, receive God's word and believe in God's word while we can. Uh, let's look at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 to 3. I believe I have that. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, it says, Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord would be established as the chief of the mountains and would be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, so that he may teach us about his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go out from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So right now, even though we are living in this pandemic and can't physically meet, we can still see the word of God, right? via YouTube and online. And right now, while the word of God is abundant, this time is referred to the acceptable time. So right now, we have to be able to study God's word, study the history of redemption, so that it is in our hearts, because a time is coming when we will not be able to worship or study the word of God, okay? Um, I believe this is in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, for he says, at a fav favorable time, I will listen to you. On a day of salvation, I help you. Behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is a day of salvation, right? Also, we have to be able to, um, we have to, it's, this is an acceptable time. But also in uh, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So as you can see, just looking around the world today, the times are becoming increasingly evil. And for the saints of the end time, we need to make the most of our time preparing with the word of God for the famine ahead. And when we look back at the time of Joseph, when the famine grew increasingly severe during the days of Joseph, the people of the world had to come to Joseph to preserve life, right? So likewise, only Jesus can save the people of this world from famine. And, and this is recorded in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. It says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among mankind by which we must be saved. Amen. So he is the only one who can give us the food for the life of the world. We see that in John chapter 6, verse 51, if you look there. So in summary, 
we too must draw closer to Jesus to preserve life in the end time. We have to draw closer to our Father to preserve life in the end time. And this is the only way to sustain life and live spiritually and physically during the wretched famine of the end time. Amen? So let's go to our final point, big point number three. So in order for the, state, the saints to remain steadfast in faith in the end times, we must be on the alert. We must be on the alert. Jesus emphatically commanded that the end time saints who are awaiting the second coming of the Lord should be on the alert. And we can see this in a couple of verses, um, Matthew chapter 24, verse 42 and 25 and 13. Let's read that. It says, therefore, be on the alert. For you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Uh, Matthew 25, 13. Be on the alert then because you do not know the day nor the hour. So here God is saying we must be ready. We must be ready. We must be on the alert. You know, just remind me of when I was in Afghanistan. I'm sorry I have to tell this, this war story. But in Afghanistan uh, during the war, um, I remember... Every day we, when we woke up, we, have, we had to put on all of this, this armor and all of this gear before we went out the gate. And this, this, this armor it was very heavy, actually. It weighed about 120 pounds. So we had to put on all this armor, our helmet, our vest, and all these things before we went out the gate. Why? Because we had to be on the alert and ready, right? So likewise, with the saints today, we have to be able to put on the armor of God as well. And we must be ready. We must be ready, right? Matthew 24 and 44 says, for this reason, you must be ready as well. For the son of man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So we must prepare and be on the alert and ready at all times and be strong in the Lord. How do we, how do we remain strong in the Lord? How do we remain strong in the Lord? We must put on the full armor of God, right? And that's the word of God, prayer, praise, worship, fellowship. We must be able to put on the full armor of God, right? And we can see this in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, um, verses 10 to 12. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the, wor the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And we can see all that is taking place as we speak, right? Also in Matthew 24, 43, it says, be on alert. Um, but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed this, his house to be broken into. Amen. So there, you know, when we, that last verse, Matthew 24 and 43, it reminds me of the command that um, God gave to Adam and Eve, you know, to cultivate the, the ground, right? To guard their heart. This is what we must do in the end times. We must guard our heart with the word of God through prayer and study of the word. And this is what God is telling the end time saints to do, right? So we must be obedient in the word. We must guard our heart with the word of God. And that way we will not be misled. We, we will not go astray, amen? So um, if we are not alert, the Bible says if we are not alert and awake with um, faith in God, we could be tempted by Satan and drift away from God's word. And what happens if we dr uh, drift away from God's word? We'll forfeit, we'll forfeit, uh, for, um, forfeit our place of blessing and ultimately pair it with the world. So if we don't come to church, if we don't pray, if we don't study the word, we'll eventually drift away. And this is why it is so important that we meet, that we study together, that we pray together, that way we'll be able to be steadfast and unmovable in God's army. Amen. So 
Therefore, let us give, let us not give the devil an opportunity. That is the key. Let us not give the devil an opportunity. And we can see this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. It says, do not give the devil an opportunity. And you can also reference uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Amen. So let us not give the devil an opportunity, but let's stay steadfast in our faith in God. Amen. So in conclusion, a true church is established upon the word of Jesus Christ. And who is Jesus Christ? He is the rock, right? And if the true church is established upon the rock, that church would neither collapse nor be overcome by the power of darkness. And we can read this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. It says, and, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades would not overpower it. Amen. So therefore, if we build our house upon the rock, we will be a church in the end time that will stand firmly upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Also, um, last night uh, during our cell meeting, we talked about reaching out to those who left the church. And so it's my prayer that we continue to reach out to, the, to them physically and with prayer. We need to go back out and try to, you know, bring back our brothers and sisters who have, you know, walked away. But let's encourage them, uh, them to come back to the bosom of God. Amen. So I pray that as we continue to study the word, let us draw closer and near to God in these end times. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. And Father, through the word, we are encouraged, Father God, to rely totally upon you in these end times and be obedient to you, Father God, that we may never go against your will. Father, I pray as we, we live in these end times, Father, let us truly seek your face, that we may be able to follow all your commands, Father God, and that we may be able to enter into that, that kingdom, of the, to the kingdom of God and live eternally with you, Father. Father, let us be diligent in our studies. Let us be diligent, Father God, in proclaiming the word of redemptive history. And Father God, let us be diligent in praying for those who are struggling. Father God, we ask that you would continue to lead and guide us with your Holy Spirit. Father, give us strength. Give us, Father God, the boldness, Father God, and let us stand firm on the rock, which is Christ Jesus. We thank you so much, Father God, and we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.